One, two, good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Mm, I'm dying. Get it right, Vic. Come on. <laughs> good evening and welcome to the second Central Area Elementary Boundary Study Committee meeting. I'm Chris Bercato from the Baltimore County Public Schools Office of Strategic Planning. Uh, welcome tonight. Welcome to our committee members who have joined us. Welcome to our observers joining us, public, and welcome to our online viewership who may be joining us at home. Uh, we'll getting, be getting started in just a moment. A few uh, housekeeping announcements, please. Um, in the event of an emergency that we would need to evacuate, please note the exit signs around you. Easiest evacuation is the door we came in, in the, at the uh, to the exterior at the rear of the cafeteria or just through the main doors to the vestibule and to your left to the outside. Um, please take a moment to sign in. Uh, there's uh, some pink sheets for our observers and some white sheets for our committee members. In the event that we did have to evacuate, we would make sure that we would take accountability based off of those sheets outside in the parking lot. So please do take a moment to sign in so that we can have accountability. All the, all the materials from tonight's meeting will be posted to our website. To, will be posted to our, I'm going to move my phone away just in case it's my phone. Um, will be posted to our website. Our website is available at www.bcps.org. Uh, if you follow the resources button at the bottom of that page, there is a link to the Central Area Elementary Boundary Study. Um, it, is a, it is a new website link. We've migrated to a new page, so if you happen to have bookmarked the old page, there's a link sending you to the updated uh, page. Same content, just a newer look, a little bit more accessible. So the, all, again, all the materials will be posted there. Um, all of the, uh, we strongly encourage, uh, we've received many, many comments from our um, constituents in the public. We encourage you, please keep those comments coming. Please follow the study, review the materials, and send us your comments. Um, I do believe you, based on the comments and feedback we have received thus far, you will, you will be seeing in the two new options that the committee is reviewing tonight, you'll be seeing some of those comments and sentiments reflected in the, uh, in the work to come tonight. So those comments are very important. They are being heard. They are being listened to. And again, we remind the committee members to please be checking in on the websites regularly. We are updating comments at least weekly on the website um, that we have received through the comment form, which is available on the web page. Um, restrooms are to the rear, uh, just out into the vestibule to your left. And with that, we're going to get started. I'm going to introduce Mr. Matt Cropper from Cropper GIS. He's going to get us started this evening. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I'm sorry, one oh. more announcement. Uh, if anyone would uh, desire Spanish translation, uh, we do have a Spanish interpreter in the rear. Her, her hand is up. Um, and <coughs> she's, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening and uh, uh, available for anyone that would desire that language translation service. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all, as Chris said, for, uh, for helping us out with this study. We really value your input and your participation in this. Um, it's really important that uh, your role in this is critical. Um, so just a quick review of our agenda tonight. We have um, three new maps that we're bringing back to you. We started with maps, maps one and two, but now you have three, four, and five at your tables. And then also the, uh, the other maps, the other options are on some reference tables. You'll see some stacks of maps. If you want to go back to those maps, you can look at those. But we have three, different, three updated maps uh, based off of input that you provided the last meeting. And the real focus tonight is for you to give us some input on that and see how they look. Um, we're going to break into small groups. Everybody has your, the color uh, associated with the group you're in. Last time you guys were split up by affiliated sort of regionally, geographically, based off of where you live. Now, the, now we're splitting you up more randomly. So, so you're, you're at tables with people who are throughout the study area so that you can benefit from perspectives of different people from different parts of the study area. Um, and then once we have our small group work complete, then we'll have a regroup as a full committee and hear what you have to say. And hopefully it'll drive 
some uh, modifications to some maps or some new maps and things like that. So here we are, second meeting. We have another meeting after this in November. And uh, once we get to this meeting, then we will have a series of public information sessions. So um, tonight's focus is not to narrow down maps per se, but still think outside the box and, and what, what could be done to, to consider in terms of map development. And then when we get to this next meeting, the, before the public info session, we'll do a, a process to start to reduce and maybe rule out some maps. It's usually best to take about three maps, four maps to the public. You don't want to take too many because then it starts to become uh, overwhelming for people to try to, to uh, understand a, a large variety of maps. But um, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So it's just a little recap on our rationale and why we have to do this work. By 2024, four elementary schools in this study area are forecasted to be over 115% utilized. Uh, you've got the list here, Timonium, Hampton, Carroll Manor, and Pine Grove. And uh, the, so the purpose of the study is to try to relieve overcrowding at, at these particular schools and maximize use of available space uh, that, that exist in our study area, all the schools that are in our study area. Um, this is our study area. Like we said last meeting, it is one of the larger study areas that Baltimore County Public Schools has, has undertaken in terms of a boundary change study, um, but it's going pretty well. We really appreciate your civility and, and, and thinking outside the box and openness at the last meeting and looking forward to it. But you can see we've got a good list of schools here. We have representatives and parents and such from all different schools and principals, and we also have BCPS support staff here to help uh, answer questions as they arise. Got uh, data uh, basically looking at end of year enrollment is what we're analyzing right now to try to give you the most recent information. Um, and so this gives you just a little preview of some of the data. Everybody should have picked up a packet of information when they signed in that you could put into your binders. Um, and that, that shows all the, the latest and greatest options and, and st uh, statistics. But you've got data here that talks about enrollment what's the enrollment data and also the utilization. I, I like to look at the percentage of capacity. That's really what helps me kind of see how things relate because some buildings have uh, 400, 300 student capacity and others have 650. So the enrollment size is one thing, but how full the building is is also another thing. It kind of levels things out and normalizes the data. Um, our objectives uh, with this process are um, to provide capacity relief to the central elementary schools and maintain or increase the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. So these are our primary tasks that, that, you, are, that you are tasked with uh, in this effort. We do have rules to follow, and these are basically what we also refer to as criteria. And when you, as you look at making boundary changes and make, it, make adjustments to the maps or developing new maps, always think about ways to better and best adhere to these rules. And they are to make efficient use of capacity and also maintain or increase the diversity of the schools to reflect the diversity of this region and the school system. There are some other ones that we look at that align with uh, best practices and maintain the continuity of neighborhoods. So try not to draw the line down a residential street, if at all possible. Um, be mindful of the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns and walkability which we have data on that. Uh, minimize the number of times any individual students are reassigned. Not only be mindful of current data, but long-term enrollment and capacity trends. So I think you may have enrollment projection uh, uh, data in your packet from the first meeting um, that kind of gives you a sense of the growth potential in these schools. And then looking at feeder school boundaries. So I, like, I, like we said at the last meeting, the focus for you guys is elementary schools only. Nothing that you do or nothing that you recommend is going to change where any student is assigned to a middle school or a high school boundary. But with that said, it, they, they are related. So as an elementary school, once they get past elementary, they feed into a middle school. So we call feeder pattern as that percentage of an elementary school that feeds to a middle. And so we have data that shows you how much of an elementary school feeds to a middle school in terms of a percentage. In a perfect world, you'd have 100% feed, feed from an elementary, all of an elementary goes to a middle school. 
Um, and, but it's very common not to have that 100% feed. So if you have to have a split, it's best to have a split be balanced and not have, say, 5% of an elementary school go to one middle school and then 95% per se go to a different one. Trying to keep in mind that children make friends at elementary school and they're continuing those friendships when they get to middle school and trying to keep bolstering that social dynamic when they, when they go to the next level that they have some familiar faces and things like that to, uh, to, to talk, talk to and, and, and hang out with. Other considerations that align with best practices are looking at geographic features um, to draw the lines along. Um, things like railroads, creeks, um, water bodies, major highways, those types of things are usually best to try to, try to align them with, with uh, geographic features, man-made and natural, um, if possible, as just something to keep in mind and be mindful of. So we have some follow-ups. There were some questions uh, as a result of your small group meetings that we've recorded and brought back to you with some follow-ups too. So uh, one of the questions was, under what conditions may a student choose to stay in their school once a boundary goes into effect? And this is always a question that's asked. Um, and this is what they call special permission transfers. So special permission transfers will be approved during the first year of a boundary change for students currently enrolled in grades four and fourth and fifth grade for this study. So if, if when, the year that this boundary change comes into effect, which is 2024, fall of 24, if, if, you're, if a student is in fourth or fifth grade, they have the ability to remain at their, at, at their school. Um, through their terminal grade. And if a student meets the criteria above and has a sibling currently enrolled in school, the sibling is also eligible to remain at the affected school through his or her or through their terminal grade. And you can see more information about this in policy and rule 5140, um, which is uh, referred to special permis permission transfers and the terminal grade policy. Another question is how are new residential developments considered in the boundary study process? So the, the, the school district has uh, uh, coordinates with the county uh, planning office to assess the impact of future development and approved residential developments on enrollment. So they incorporate that into their enrollment projection data. Information on currently approved residential developments, including number of units and anticipated student yields, are included in the meeting two handouts. So we did give you some data on developments within this, this study area that could affect enrollment and, uh, at particular schools so that you can be mindful and as proactive as possible. Um, the student yields were calculated using a study from 2022 that calculated, uh, studied the housing data throughout the county and, and, and calculating how many kids come out of different housing types and that is used as a guide to anticipate how many are gonna come out of future housing. And this data is provided to inform the committee's consideration of the draft options as you, as you, can, as you look at maps and try to be as proactive as possible with uh, the boundary uh, options. We have another question here that was related to the magnet program at Cromwell Valley. And I was going to invite Dr. Elmendorf up, um, uh, the Executive Director of Academic Programs and Options. And you have a microphone, so go ahead. Check. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. So uh, most of what you need to know for this question is on the slide here. Is there somewhere I can stand that's covered better? Over here. Um, but, um, see my teacher. Hello? Hello? All right. The magnet process, so decisions about magnet schools and magnet programs, is separate from the boundary process. It is part of policy 6400, and the board um, has the final decision on any programs that would be changed, any schools that would be changed um, as it relates to magnet. And so there are no um, plans to change Cromwell Valley Magnet um, program right now. 
You can see up here that the school enrollment varies annually from 390 students to 410 students. And the capacity is 434 students, which leaves between 24 and 44 students um, seats available to help balance utilization. What I can tell you is that we typically start with 24 seats for our magnet students, and then based on what the boundary um, enrollment is for kindergarten that year, we may work with the principal to put a, a few more students into those magnet seats. Also, in some cases, when there are students who leave Cromwell Valley up through fourth grade by way of attrition, we'll also offer seats from time to time for um, students to be in those seats as well. And I, I wanted to, um, I think there was a question, I wasn't here last time my colleague was, but I think there was a question about what is the magnet at Cromwell Valley Elementary School, and this is on our website in our brochure, but I want to share that with you. It is a STEAM magnet. So at Cromwell Valley, students develop 21st century skills, including communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity in a rigorous program of learning that integrates BCPS curriculum, STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and computer science. In an engaging, hands-on, project-based environment, students develop a well-rounded understanding of the world through a multidisciplinary approach focused on innovation and problem solving. Students are empowered to become producers of information as they write code, implement the engineering design process, and persevere to solve complex problems. So Cromwell Valley is a whole magnet school, so every student that's at Cromwell Valley participates in the program that I just described to you. The 24 students that I was talking to you about previously are students that would come in from outside of the boundary. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see if there are any, are any other questions about magnets, but thank you for being here, and uh, definitely a good resource to help give in, insight into the magnet programming uh, in the district. So um, <clears throat> another question that was, uh, that was asked at meeting one, it was can updated enrollment be provided? So like I said, we, we, right now we have the end of year enrollment data that's, that's used as a basis for what we're doing right here. Um, unofficial September 30th, 2023 enrollment will, at the school level will be provided at the next meeting. So it takes some time for the school district to rectify numbers, making sure that if student, as students transfer in and out that they get all the, the duplicates resolved, things like that. So it takes a little bit of time to get things cleaned up, and they anticipate to have that data for you at the next meeting for the September 30th, 2023. I don't know if we will have it all incorporated into uh, mapping in the, in the options at the next meeting, but, um, but we'll have enrollment data for you to evaluate and to, and to be able to compare to what we have, what we're looking at currently at a minimum. There were some updates to boundaries. We did identify uh, that there was some cl clarified information regarding a walk zone for Pot Spring Elementary. There was a small area that's circled here that you can see within a planning block that was outside of a planning block. Uh, Mildridge, uh, Midridge Road, Knob Hill Court, and Treetop Court, they are in the walk zone for Pot Spring. And so they, this was moved into the planning block um, uh, from 1310 to 1311. So it got moved into this planning block so that we can make sure that we have all walkers within a planning block. It, it amounts to two students. And so the, you'll see that pl the uh, planning block numbers go up by two in 1311 and down by two in 1310 in the revisions. So, um, so that, that does affect the walk zone totals by two students. Just making sure that we have everything as accurate as possible and we appreciate input. Um, uh, things like this is really what helps us make things better so um, so this is an update to the planning the planning blocks to help co incorporate the walk zones make sure we have them all there's also some new middle school boundaries that were approved in june of this year as part of the central and northeast middle school boundary study um, these boundaries are going to be phased in um, in two phases so phase one will occur for next school year in 24-25 and the majority of the changes that are being, that are, were approved are happening next year. But there is a second phase in 25-26 that affects uh, two planning blocks that are, are gonna be moving, not, not moving until the next year. So we do have some reference maps. I think if you look on um, those back tables, there's, some, uh, there's a reference map that says something about planning block moves um, and show you near the phasing of it. It's really, revolving around the additional construction at, um, I believe it's Pine Grove, 
um, middle school, and then that's not going to come online until t uh, 25, 26, and so that's, that's what triggers those additional two uh, shifts in planning blocks within this study area. There's a lot of other adjustment happening as a result of that study, but we're re re referring just to the planning blocks that you guys are looking at for the study. Uh, maps and feeder tables have been updated to reflect the final approved boundaries. You'll see that planning block 428 is zoned for Lock Raven in 2526, and planning block 1002 will be zoned for Pine Grove Middle in 2526. Those are the two planning blocks that I was referring to. Uh, we have received a number of comments, like Mr. Bricado said. Uh, we have 113 total comments provided, a lot of constructive input, and uh, we encourage you guys to go look at this. These are these comments are logged on the, the, the resource page for this boundary change study, and it's a lot of good, helpful information to look at and see what people are saying. Um, there are many comments were, that we've received so far were regarding Knollwood and Wiltondale communities in the Stonely Elementary Zone. Uh, there were recommendations to further reduce impacts to all students, which is something that we, we heard from you guys as committee members, so I think that the general public is mirroring some comments that you have made uh, and given us some direction to, to, to look at uh, for these next, these upcoming maps. But all comments, like I said, are posted on the Boundary Study webpage. Encourage you guys to take a look and just check it every once in a while. We, we like to look at it. Very helpful information to see uh, what's being said and we, we try to glean constructive input from these and see if there's anything that can be done or if we're missing anything, just making sure that no stone is left unturned as we work through this. As you know, as you, as, as you recall, we did work in small groups. You guys did at the first meeting. Uh, you reviewed, reviewed two plot maps of our baseline draft options. Um, draft option two did garner the most attention from committee members. That was the one that seemed to be to come up to the front and people were talking about with markups and things like that. And there were some suggestive changes to the options, including uh, reducing the total number of impacted students, keeping the northern Stonely elementary communities in the Stonely zone, and then trying not to impact walkers. Try to maximize, maintain students who can walk to school, try to make sure that they continue to have that opportunity. We have five maps tonight for you to review. Uh, like I said, one and two have not been modified. We still have those. If you want to pull those back up and look at them for reference or, or continue to, to evaluate those, but we have uh, three, four, and five that are at everyone's table. We, I kind of set up the tables a little bit so that you guys can spread out. I know these things are designed for eight people, but it gets really tight around here. So, um, so feel free when you break into small groups to spread out into available space. I tried to give available tables so that you guys can kind of get a little more comfortable. I know you have big binders, a lot of maps. There's a lot of stuff that you have at your hands. Uh, so we want to give you as much space as possible. We do have our online interactive map, which we find is a very useful resource. These maps are large scale. They don't have every single road labeled, but that interactive map is something I use all the time. I have it on my phone. We got here, we've been here for a couple days, and we've been driving around the study area for the, and, and looking at that map. It's just a very good resource to see. When you zoom in, you see a lot more detail. And, um, and then, like Chris said, copies of everything is available on the BCPS page. For any members of the public who want to go and download any materials that the committee has, um, you can point them to that to download any information that, that, so that they can benefit from all the materials that you guys have in front of you. Uh, always want to remind you that everything is draft. I know that this process always uh, incites emotion. And people always get emotional about map changes and how things may move. and whether that are being considered, but always remember that nothing is written in stone, everything is draft. Um, even when it comes out of your hands and goes to the school board's hands, it's still draft. Nothing is final until it is approved by the board. So just keep that in mind, we're still looking for input, ways to make these best. Uh, and at this point, we're not focusing on picking the best solution, but try to openly explore options to see what, what could we consider, and then we'll start narrowing down at the next meeting. Just a little preview on three through five. Uh, three and four will develop from, from committee feedback and discussion during meetings. Uh, we did make an effort, concerted effort, to reduce impacts in, in uh, three and four. And you'll notice that I think the impacts are down in the 400s, 
where the previous maps had 900. Uh, so we cut, cut the impacts down and, and nearly half, trying to, to adhere to some of the input that you provided. Uh, these maps, three and four, do keep Stonely communities together, and we do preserve walking walkers in those maps. We do have the benefit of having a committee member proffer a map, option five, uh, looking, at, um, looking at the map. We, we had the time to put that together, e evaluate it, put it on paper, and it was built off of option two with some suggested changes. And one of the things you'll see is that every school is under 100% in that map. So we look forward to having you take a look at that and seeing what you think about option five as well as, as another uh, map to consider. Again, you've got data, uh, a lot of information. This is estimated enrollment. Tells you that this is what you would go to if someone says, how many students are estimated at this school? This is what you would go to. It gives you the total number of students in any particular option and then also what our starting point is. You also have capacity data for reference. You have utilization, which I said this is what, it's the same data, but it's looking at it in a percentage stamp, standpoint. It's the same thing, but it's just looking at it in a different format. And you have over and under capacity. So if it's a mi negative sign, it tells you if there is, uh, how many seats are available. If it's, if it's a positive number, then that tells you how many seats they have over 100%. So, um, and then I always like to point people to the total at the bottom. This shows you 96% is what we're working with. So ideally, in a perfect world, you know, every school would be around that number. So that gives you sort of a target, a soft target for the, um, for, what, uh, for what the schools could be if you wanted to have perfect, uh, perfect balance of utilization. We have the demographic data that's included for all five options and the current. So this is just a sample showing option four, but you can see the race and ethnic data, and also we have um, economic disadvantage, free and reduced meals, and English language learner percentages. So just to give you an idea on how, what impact may be made on, um, on demographics as boundaries and options are being evaluated. Impacts, so this is the impact data. Um, so I did, I, I said it was 400, I guess I was wrong. It's more like 530, 560 is the new maps. And then the option five impacts 900, but still um, the, the, these two do uh, impact a lot fewer than one and two. And, um, and option five impacts up similar to option two, a little bit fewer. When you look at this, you'll see the tan lines show you where students are moving. So 51 students in option three move from Carroll Manor to Jacksonville. And the green says th that's basically a, the, where students don't move. So these totals, these tan totals make up the total number of impacts as you see here. So this helps you understand where kids are moving, how many are moving, and that kind of thing. Feeder patterns, this shows you that percentage I was talking about, how, what percentage is split. So we're trying to get rid of things like this Hampton, a 6% to Lock Raven. Um, and you know, also look at three-way splits, trying to see if we can cut that down. You can see this map, option four, brings it to a better balance for Hampton, for example, and trying to reduce the three-way splits as well. We count the number of splits just so that we can quantify how many split t splits there are total from the current and any particular option just for another rep other reference. But this is just a sample for four, we have uh, all, all five options have these data in your handout. Walk zones, showing us the walkability, walkable areas, and so this shows where we have current walkers, numbers, and then how each option sizes up. You'll see that there are some, some areas where the number actually goes up, and that's because we're also not only looking at the current walk zones, but we have something called walkout boundaries, which shows what the potential walkability is. So there are areas that may not be zoned to a school, where kids could actually walk to that school. And so you'll see that number goes up because that the students are, were added to a school that, where they could actually walk to that, that school. So that's the walk data. Uh, just, just a quick review of the options. We've got um, option one, capacity relief to Timonium, Hampton, and Pine Grove, the schools that have some of the greater needs. Uh, Pine Grove still remains over, over capacity in option one. All schools are within 8% of the study area average of 96. 
Uh, this one does impact the greatest number, which is uh, probably why it wasn't the, the, the more popular map at the first meeting. Um, we do reduce the walkers in this map, and then feeders, feeder pattern splits do go down on this map. Map two, again, capacity relief to some of the schools that have the greatest needs. Um, Oakley is at 100, 102 and Pedone is at 101, still over 100%, but we have all schools are within 8%, try, drawing closer to that average. This one impacts the second largest number of students at 912, and we had 12, 12 walkers that were impacted in this, and the feeder patterns do improve by one split. Map three is one of the newer map, the new maps that we're presenting tonight. Uh, capacity relief is provided to the schools, just like the others. Pedonia is at 110%, it remains over capacity, although it is unimpacted in this particular map. Um, it, this impacts the least number of students of all options at 530. All walkers who, are, who can walk are, are still walking, able to walk to school. Feeder patterns go down by two splits in this particular map. Um, the fourth map, uh, again, capacity relief, like we're, like we're trying to do with all the maps. Pedonia does stay at 110% in map four. It impacts the second least number of students. No walk zone students are impacted, and like I said, it actually increases the walk zone eligible for Rogers Forge Elementary School. So that's where you saw that number go up. Um, and then feeder pattern splits go from nine to seven. This is the map five, option five. Capacity relief at all schools. Um, every school is under 100%, so a, a very good balance of utilization. Um, it ha impacts the third largest number of students at 905. Um, um, impacts the Pedonia walk zone uh, students, that students that can walk to Pedonia, which is very difficult because it's a very small zone. If, uh, if, you've, if you've been around Pedonia, it's a very concentrated area. And then walk eligible students increase for Warren and Halstead Academy, though. Feeder patterns go down from nine to six. So this one probably does the best of the, the maps in terms of improving feeder pattern continuity and the number of splits. So we're gonna have you guys, uh, you're already in your small groups. We're gonna have you collaborate within these small groups. You have about an hour, so we're giving you plenty of time to look through the maps, spread out. Uh, you've got post-it notes and markers we encourage you to make notes on the maps or make notes on post-it notes so that we can take this information, take notes, and, and, make, and, 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 and capture all of your comments. We recommend about 20 minutes per option so you can kind of keep time on it. Um, and then after, they, after you review options, there's going to be a discussion around the, op the observations. Uh, one of the things I would like to say is last time, we, the principals did an amazing job of, of sort of being a spokesperson for every group. But we wanted to let you guys know as principals, don't feel like you have to be the, the person coming up and speaking at the mic at every time. You can always have if somebody else is motivated and wants to be the speaker. They, you can always give them the mic and they, they could be the speaker. So don't feel like you have to be the, uh, the reporter at, at all of these. There's a parking lot page, the, the orange page. If you have questions that may not be related to what we're doing, uh, you can put that on the parking lot, and that's what, those are questions that we'll follow up on, okay? So, um, just always look at things as options, uh, challenges related to planning blocks and those types of things as you do your work, okay? So, uh, we're, any questions before we let you break up in the groups? Yes. Uh, well, let's get a microphone over here real quick. Hello? Okay. Um, my question is, uh, I, I'm a rep sorry, I'm a representative from Carroll Manor, and I, because we're one of the schools that needs relief, I, but it's weird because we're not over capacity right now, so I'm a little uh, confused and want to appreciate any guidance you guys might have in terms of what represents capacity relief at Carroll Manor, because um, the initial I can just look at the page real quick, sorry. Currently, it's at 95%, but in options three and four, you
check, one, two, check, one, two. Check, 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 one, two, one, two. There we go. So not, not to uh, belabor it more, but in options four, uh, three and four, you had said it provided capacity relief, but it was actually at a higher capacity than the beginning of the study. So I just am not sure what we're looking for in terms of achieving that goal. That's not the question. What I would say is always, that's why I pointed to the study area average, it's 96%. So ideally you wanna be somewhere close to that number. So if it's within a couple of percentage points of that, I mean, it's, it's all really up to you and what you feel is acceptable as a committee member. It's at 95 right now. It's at 95 right now, so you're right, yes. And so you're right at near, uh, near the study area average at 96. But Usually when we work with this, it's like plus or minus, uh, trying to keep them below 100, but trying plus or minus around 5%, I think is something that like a, a band, a good confidence band to, to work with, but that's really up to you what you feel is acceptable for the school and, um, and just trying to make things as equitable as possible as it relates to relief across the area. I wanted to add a little bit more to the response. Um, one of the main things that we do here is make sure that the committee is the one that makes the decisions about what should or should not happen. So we could have said, well, any school that's already at 95, then why do they have to be here? That's the target. That's not up to us. It's up to you. The other thing is, um, even though right now there are no capital projects planned for that area, that is in the works, it's being discussed now. So we will be providing capital project in that area, hopefully, within five years. Any other questions from any committee members before we let you uh, break into your small groups? Okay. We need it for live, it's, it's really for live for the recording. Your voice for the recording. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Hello. Um, something that you just said. So. If there is a capital project possibly being considered in five years, does that mean in five years we'd be doing this all over again? More students might have to go. Short answer is yes. Um, once a decision is made that we're gonna do a capital project to deal with the state and the county is a long process. In five years, be very accurate, is the earliest that it could happen, the doors could open. From once a decision is made, we're gonna go through with it. Um, we don't like having to move kids often. Um, we figured that after three years, it's probably different kids. You know, even though it's a change of a boundary of a school, it's not the same children. Um, so we feel like after five years, um, that it's more important to make sure schools aren't overcrowded than it is not to move any kids at all. Thanks for saying that, because that was my question. Um, so I'm curious about the impacts of overcrowding versus moving between five and a thousand kids. So like on student learning and student outcomes, are we finding that some of these schools that are you know, minorly overcrowded, is it really impacting student learning? to warrant the kind of impact of student learning that moving families and kids and communities would have? I don't have any actual data on that, um, but anecdotally, it, there does seem to be a certain point where overcrowding is impacting the students. And that's when we're triggering to do a boundary study. Um, moving kids, that's an issue Again, it's up to the community to decide that. We're not going to prejudge what that limit is, where that line is drawn. You'll have to decide. Read the comments that you get from the community. Um, they may say, yeah, we can't wait to move into a brand new school. Or I don't like this school. I don't mind moving over there. This makes the neighborhood much more cohesive. No, this divides up the neighborhood. Those are the kind of comments we get. In every boundary study, it's different. So read the comments. Um, use your best judgment, talk to each other, 
and then you make that judgment call as to which is more important. Um, to kind of answer that question, it does affect a lot when a school is overcrowded. And you also have to recognize, maybe try to pay attention to more than just classroom size and the school facilities and capabilities. So like Hampton might have, I don't know, whatever they're quoting this, this time, it seems like a different number every time, but um, they expanded our school 10 years ago, but they never touched the gymnasium or the cafeteria. So our cafeteria is rated for 300 kids, but when you have 816 kids trying to make it through the cafeteria, it's gonna be a problem. When you have eight bathroom stalls per gender for 800 kids, it's gonna be a problem. So it might not just be in the classroom, it's affecting the school as a whole. So like the numbers aren't just classroom size or how many kids are sitting, you know, three to the bus and then in the aisles and things like that. It's also about using the bathrooms. It's about getting to go to assemblies all together as a school or having events or sitting in the cafeteria and being able to eat your lunch without losing your hearing. So there's, there's more to school capacity than just um, seats at desks. I wanna build off that last comment there because I remember when my daughter was in first grade, she was at Pleasant Plains, which is Prince Albert, where we are. Hello. Um, there is about, I think, 715, 720 students for, I think it was rated at 515 or 516 at the time. And to your point, it, it, all these small areas, whether it be the hallways, the cafeterias, the limited number of bathrooms, thank you for the verb, turn down the volume, and also, though, my daughter would, you know, eat breakfast at like 8.30, show up and have lunch at 10.15. And then, that was all of first grade, lunch at 10.15. Nobody would eat <laughs> because they just ate an hour and a half ago. And, you know, then you have them at 1 o'clock when they haven't eaten lunch. And now you got the teachers and the staff have to deal with first graders who haven't eaten and now are losing their minds. And in an overcrowded school, that is incredibly uh, a bad, difficult, and potentially dangerous situation when uh, you have that many kids and that many kids who are not eating and you know other consequences there. So it is; it has a greater impact on just beyond this class has 28, this class has 27, this class has 30, or whatever the case may be. It's not as simple as that. I have uh, two process-oriented questions. One is a curiosity around the ability to see the, the delta or change for a, student's, uh, a, a school's student body enrollment changing from one school to another. I ask that because there's one school I identified where 40% of the student body or more is being shifted to other schools, which is a sizable impact to have on, on one school. The second process-oriented question is if it's possible to, uh, as we are at some point maybe narrowing options, to look at the um, racial demographics within planning blocks and uh, to understand exactly which students we, uh, as a committee, and I'll speak with myself as a, as a white man in the central area of Baltimore County, uh, with all of the history of Baltimore around um, housing and line drawing, uh, we are asking which families to move, uh, we are forcing which families to move schools in order uh, to provide relief to other areas of the um, county. I think that's an important lens to apply. We have the, the impact data tells you how many are moving from school to school, uh, but maybe we can look at ways to kind of summarize that so that you can see the percentage of students that may be impacted out of school. So that's something that we will look at and see if there's some data that we can provide to give you other information on that. And then we will also follow up regarding something to give you more insight towards the demographics of, uh, of communities in this study area. And so we have to be mindful and uh, have to be respectful of individuals' privacies and things like that. So it will, will, but we will go through uh, a process and make sure that we follow up with you regarding demographics, to give you some more insight to demographics of the study area. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Representative 
West Towson Elementary. I'm just wondering, um, and I'm not sure if it now or after we review the maps is the best time to ask this question, but um, it seems like geographic boundaries and the, from what I see from the, all, the new options as well, seem to be the primary focus in sort of redistricting in these maps or like on, on these options that were, that were being given, um, where as you know, the, the primary focus is supposed to be either you know, increasing diversity or um, the efficient use of space. Um, these maps don't really make sense to me. <laughs> um, we, I know our group had made some suggestions the last time, none of them seem to have been taken into account. Um, I, I know, you know the, the, the geographic boundaries do need to be, I mean, it, they seem to be the more obvious, uh, uh, what do I wanna say? The, yes, the, <laughs> the more obvious way to sort of look and rezone, but they, they don't always make the most sense, and especially with regard to diversity. I know, at least in my district, I'm not familiar um, with some of the other districts as much, but um, at least in like West House and Riderwood, um, with regard to diversity, these just don't, I, I'm a little confused. Okay, so we- shed some light on that. Sure, so when we, um, when we developed, the, Gabe brought the, the first two maps, we were, we were uh, hearing from the committee that impacts were too great. So we followed up with maps that impacted fewer students. Um, all we need from you as a committee member or committee members is to tell us what you would like to see different. If you'd like to see a map that does a better job, that, does, uh, that makes a, a more concerted effort at doing something in terms of as it relates to demographics, uh, and you can even specify sp schools, um, that's something that as a committee member, if you give us that directive, we will follow up with you and bring a map that does our best effort to um, adhere and, and account for your, your question. The, the easiest way to describe it is you mark up the map, we'll send it back to you with your markups reflected. If you want a specific planning block moved to some area, you want to see how to... Can you... Maybe that's the problem. If you want a specific planning blocks moved to a certain section, and then you want to see how it works out statistically, just mark it up on a map or write it down, and then we'll make sure a map is produced for the next meeting that reflects what you specifically wanted to change. Okay, hopefully, okay, because I, I want you all to start to. My question is specific to the parking lot questions. I had two or three questions that were specifically data driven from the last meeting that aren't reflected, and I want to know how we'll find out about how those will be answered. Okay, if we miss something, definitely d check with me. I will, I will make sure that I, um, let me know what may have been missed, and we'll definitely make sure to follow up on it. Uh, we tried to capture everything. We may have missed a couple of questions, but we will, let me know. I will definitely come talk to you uh, when you guys break up into groups and make sure that we capture those questions. And, and I think, Putting it on the parking lot page would be good as well, so. And let me add that I know your questions, I remember. Um, some of the ideas or thoughts that people have require us to go to other offices in BCPS to get information, and we just were not able to get an, a definite answer to your questions by now. And uh, we'll be going around, make, see if there's any questions. But go ahead, you guys can go ahead and start your small group work and we'll check in with you.
Maybe that's his follow-up so we can do it. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay, no problem. Yeah. Um,
Okay, how's how's everybody? How's everyone doing? You guys uh, need like five more minutes, or you guys feel like you're about ready? How about you guys? Pretty ready, or you need about five minutes? Okay, good. How about five? Let's do like just less than five minutes. I'm going to go just get a feel for the small groups, but we'll be regrouping here shortly. All right, so I think we're ready to regroup. Um, and this group over here, guys, uh, definitely look like you're ready. One of the things I would like to start, are we ready? Are we, does anybody else need more time in your small groups? Is everybody ready? I, I, think, we're, I think we're good. So can we, re, can, we, uh, can we reconvene as a group committee? If we could, uh, calm down the chatter so that we could hear uh, uh, each group provide their input. One of the things before we get into it is I have had, just as a follow-up, guys, can we, can we, uh, can we regroup? So as, as a follow-up, one of the things, there was a comment, in the I've had several discussions about Rogers Forge and uh, the, the, the neighborhood, the community right next to it that's walkable. 
to Rogers Forge. It was mentioned at the last meeting, and it wasn't captured in this series of maps. I know that there's, we can all, we could talk about rationale on uh, that, but I will tell you that that area will, we will put that area into Rogers Forge and the next series of maps uh, based off of input from the committee. We do our best at all of these meetings to try to capture all the comments and input from you guys. We are genuinely interested in hearing your input and trying to make, reflect your input on these maps. So I do apologize if that was missed or if it was one that, that did not make it to this, the next series of maps, but that will be one that, uh, that is incorporated into the next series of maps for your consideration and your review. So I wanted to set that, because I had several conversations about that, but I just wanted to give you that guarantee that we will be bringing that. And we try to hear everything you say and make sure that we capture everything and try to take notes. But some, we're human beings, sometimes we miss things, but uh, just help keep us on track. Everything is draft. We have time to keep, make sure we make, get this right, okay? So with that said, why don't we, uh, we have a microphone that we could uh, go to take to this group over here. Let's start with uh, the Magenta group for, um, for your comments and any changes or uh, edits that you want. Hi. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I think our primary concern um, in our group was, you know, we did, we did mention the Rogers Forge apartments that are across the street from Rogers Forge Elementary School. Um, moving them into the Rogers Forge Elementary School District would allow them to just get to school quickly, walk across the street safely, and it would eliminate an entire bus full of children for West Towson during a bus driver shortage. Um, uh, another concern was the the redistricting of PB 1912 and PB 1913, moving them into Riderwood. Um, I know geographically it seems to make sense. It's just this is a transportational nightmare for those those families that live there. These um, all those neighborhoods are really just accessible. Um, especially PB 1913, they really only have access to Charles Street. They would have to drive right past West Towson Elementary School to get to Riderwood um, and then fight traffic on Joppa Road. It's not ideal for them. Um, it would take a lot longer for the children to get to school. Um, 1912 would be the same issue. Um, we, Timonium Elementary School District, I, there was an, uh, some concern about moving um, PB 9, 1701 and 1702 into Pot Spring. Um, I, I don't think, can you, you could shed a little bit more light on the. Yeah, the neighborhood. That's a uh, neighborhood, and we don't think that that would be what's best for those students to split up a neighborhood. Uh, 1701 and 1702. It's, it splits a neighborhood in half. I mean, some of these streets are being cut in half. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly the most egregious issue would probably be those Rogers Forge apartments. I know it's, it's 35 children, but it, I mean, it would certainly it would help those families. Um, they have walking access. It would increase diversity at the school. Um, and then I think there are a few children who are bused in a very small district of Rogers Forge that could be just bused to West Housen. Um, uh, you also... Um, I've also heard PB 1502 and 1911 that were, one of them is the three students that's in Rogers Forge right now. Yes. Those, um, that, those students are the only students on a bus to Rogers Forge. Correct. So the, that 1502 and 1911 should not be at Rogers Forge because they are the only students that are on a bus. Correct. They, they're the only they're, ones. I think they had requested at some, what I had, my understanding is that they had previously requested a crossing guard or crosswalk. The, county refused to grant it to them and so they're the only three children being bused to Rogers Forge that would eliminate another bus okay. um, moving them to West Towson because I, I think the uh, their backyards back up to families who do get bused to West Towson so that would seems like a pretty okay. simple fix um, am I missing anything no okay next <laughs> okay thank you thank you very much um, okay, uh, who wants to, I guess we'll just move right down the line. You're going with the, the, I think it's the light blue group. 
Hi, everybody. So obviously, in our opinion, option five is the best for everybody. The biggest concern, I'm from Pot Spring, but my biggest concern is Padonia is overcrowded in the other options, and those students go to school to get the services that their families can't provide. English, food, love, support, trauma help. If we're, excuse me, if we're gonna keep them in a school that's overcrowded, how can Baltimore County guarantee the resources that they will need to get the help? Also, all the schools that are going to increase, how can Baltimore County guarantee the help that they're gonna need as well? Again, guidance counselors, administration, triple A's, paras, like how can Baltimore County guarantee that? We're already in a shortage of staff. Um, the other points that we had are, um, sorry, I'm reading my notes. So the other question we had, if you're talking about another boundary change in three to five years, why are you going to affect all the schools now? Why not just take from the schools that need the relief and then in five years start this over? It's a fresh roll of students. Most of the families that are in elementary school will already be out. So why move the families again in another five years? And if there are already families that were moved in the first place, why do it to them possibly three times? And then there's one more point for my other friend. <laughs> Um, we, we had a long talk about Cromwell Valley and how it's a magnet, and I know that's beyond the scope of the study, but I guess what we wanted to point out was, if you look at the one page in, that we got from the first meeting, there's 148 students at Cromwell Valley that are out of the study area. Uh, if hypothetically Cromwell Valley was not a magnet, and those students, because I presume they're all from magnet students, were returned to their home schools outside of this area, that's 150 seats, pretty much, in a critical area of this map that really needs help. I mean, it's basically Hampton, Oakley, Pine Grove are all adjacent to that that could be helped if those seats were opened up. So, I, I, you know, I don't really understand the nuances of the magnet school. I don't know if it could be, a magnet school could be moved to a different location. I mean, you have the same thing at a different location, but potentially that would solve a lot of the issues that we have with the overcrowding of the schools in that part of this central area. So, um, that's, that's gonna be a thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yes. What group are you guys? Yellow. 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 Okay. Yes, we're the yellow group. Sorry. Um, we had a preference for map three because there are fewer students that are being uh, moved overall by a significant margin. Um, we did note some areas in here where we felt that. Pedonia's um, capacity could be relieved to a lower amount by moving some students uh, into Mays Chapel or Pot Spring, um, which could ultimately help bring that number down and then reduce the number of students that are being removed um, overall. Um, we had some similar comments around uh, specific planning blocks that were breaking up neighborhoods. I know the Timonian ones were already mentioned. Um, there were some planning blocks uh, in Lutherville, about, um, let's see, 6, 08, 09, 08, and 10, that try to keep those together. Um, and then planning blocks 6, 11, and 6, 12, try to keep those in Lutherville to maintain that school's diversity. What do we do with 6, 11, and 6, 12? Um, to try to keep them in Lutherville to help maintain that school's diversity. The other thing we wanted to point out was that you know the diversity and maintaining or increasing diversity of the schools is a primary consideration and if you look at the numbers in the binder about the number of schools that would be you know sort of what the average population is for white students black students economically disadvantaged students um, the number of schools that would see an increase in white students sorry the number of schools where white students are above the, the average in the area would actually increase in all of these maps all five of them the number of schools where the black population or the economically disadvantaged population would decrease or um, would, be, would be under the, would be above the average, would decrease in all these maps. And so we feel as though we're not hitting our diversity primary consideration in any of the five maps right now. Okay. What, uh See, are you guys in the yellow? What uh, do your what group are you guys? Uh, we are the orange group. So I think overall, uh, three and four disrupted the fewest number of students, and I think that was a um, a 
highlight for our group, the least disruptive changes we can make um, would be the best. This seems like a Band-Aid to a bigger problem where we need more schools. And if there's gonna be more a new, new school in five years, let's not uh, shift students all around. We noticed um, a lot of the maps, it was a domino effect. So you move students from here to here to here to here. Um, and it just in, would disrupt a lot of families. So the least impact to students and families as possible um, was kind of our focus. So we didn't leave notes. Um, on three and four, are there any notes we, I want to? Okay. Um, on uh, map four, we made a lot of notes um, about how the shift, again, the domino effect, um, that how it impacts Ryderwood and West Towson. Possibly have a couple committee members like hold the map up and maybe just kind of show us the show us the edits that uh, you were considering so i think the issue when we come back uh if you could i'm sorry uh come back to this corner right here would be good so everybody could see it sorry to make you <laughs> migrate a little bit but thank you okay so um, the schools in this area, we spent a lot of time looking at, and we noticed kind of like, again, a domino effect. There was a shift this way. Um, and the notes we made were to keep neighborhoods um, as they were, to maintain neighborhoods. Um, and keep, uh, yeah, keep as many kids at the same school um, as possible, I think. No, that's correct. Um, one other thing I, I wanted to mention, my group co-member, Rachel, let me know that there is a lot of public comments that were sent in a hyperlink over email that somebody sent over the last week. And one thing we noticed um, from these public comments was the York Manor area of Timonium Elementary School. And I'm not sure if anybody from this group is, is living in that neighborhood, but on every single one of the options, York Manor is moving to a different school. That, neighbor, that block, and there's two blocks, but this one block in particular is being shifted to Lutherville Lab. What is the block number? Block number 1715. 1715. It's, yeah, it's a large group, and so there's no option that keeps them where they are. Okay. So every single option, they're moving. And uh, West, or not West, Timonium Elementary and Lutherville are both over capacity schools. Um, and then the other consideration there is that that is York Road that they would be crossing to go to school. Anybody? Oh yeah, look at the public comments. They're really good. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, there was some comment about the comments, the public comments uh, in that it would be beneficial to have those printed out for you in your packets. And so that's something that we will definitely uh, look at providing you so that you have those for additional reference as you work in your small groups. And, but we do encourage you to always you know, try to look at those whenever you have time, but we will definitely provide those for you so that you have them here with your materials as well. Okay, the Lime Green Group. to be over here okay all right so on option number five uh, we have not using 695 as a boundary for Riderwood that was very problematic for Riderwood to use that as the boundary another note that we made was if we are potentially re restructuring in five years impacting this many students is really not appropriate for the time being 
to go to option four, PB1005 and 1006, shifting to Carroll Manor. Yes, right group? Good. Okay. Um, for PB1915 to Rogers Forge, similar to the other group's feedback, and then PB1911, PB1502 to West Towson. Another note is Padonia needs relief. And then for option three, PB1005, same, and 1006 to Carroll Manor, same as for option four. Uh, for PB1005, the numbers did seem inaccurate to us, so if that could be reviewed, that would be great, just to double check on them. So for PB1005, the numbers seemed inaccurate. Okay. And that it was... Seems too high, you think? Yes. Yes. Too high. Okay. Uh-huh. And so, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, so the, the comments about starting at PB1005 down to uh, Pedonia needing relief, those are related to option four comments. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Right. Anything else, group? Good? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so moving right along on the, with the blue group. Sure. Uh, so the blue group, uh, call us crazy, but we kind of uh, pulled back and looked at the map as is, and then looked at what schools need relief and what schools have room, and we thought maybe we could you know, shift students from the schools that need relief to schools that need room without affecting very many other schools and leaving them uh, unimpacted. So uh, we looked at Pedonia needing relief and Mays Chapel needing room. So moving planning blocks 901 through 905, moved 66 students from Pedonia to Mays Chapel, Pedonia needs relief for at least 55 students, Mays Chapel has room for 143, so moving 66 students uh, seems, seems like that would work for that area. Then uh, across the, the southern part of the central area here, we saw that, pine, uh, oh, one more thing, uh, Timonium. So we also uh, reflected on the public comment and saw that overwhelmingly uh, the, the sentiment expressed by the Timonium community was that they wanna keep their boundary as is. Uh, that's echoed by a parent representative here and by another uh, group earlier. So um, we left Timonium out of the uh, problem solving process for us for the time being given uh, respect to their uh, community's wishes there. Uh, so we saw Pine Grove and Hampton uh, need relief. Uh, Cromwell, Westhausen, and Riderwood have uh, space. So basically moving some students uh, east to west, or some planning blocks east to west. So uh, in, uh, if we move uh, from west to east. I think everybody's looking at the one in front of them. All right. Anyway, um, if, if 1912, 1913, 1901 and 1902 move from West Towson to Riderwood. Uh, that puts 54 more students in Riderwood with room for up to maybe 78. If planning blocks 413, 416, 417 move Hampton to West Towson, that uh, means that West Towson law gave 54 to Riderwood, gained 119, so on the whole they're plus 65, having room for 98. Um, moving on to planning blocks 411, 422, 428. If those move from Hampton to Cromwell, that puts 41 more students at Cromwell with room for 48. It takes 41 more students out of Hampton. And uh, then if we move planning block 1004 from Pine Grove to Hampton, that relieves Pine Grove by 85 students and leaves Hampton on the whole down 75, which is not their total of 105, but it provides significant relief to, um, to Hampton. So uh, that was, we're calling option six. Uh, so the, anyway, that's, a, that's an option. 
And then there was a couple other notes just uh, from um, five. Uh, so a, a question that came up in looking at Pine Grove needing relief, there are a couple schools neighboring Pine Grove, um, Harford Hills and Kearney uh, and, and Villa Cresta with Oakley. So wondering if, if uh, that inclusion might um, have some more sense uh, for, for communities that are bordering. And anything else on another option? We also worked on option three um, and had some similar solutions that I think one of the groups over here just talking about, like it seems like they were trying to relieve by moving up and it was like a necessary relief, like there was no purpose to the relief. So we tried to fix that. And then also <coughs> um, because Lutherville Lab was so much affected, like I think their population was upwards of 40% was gonna change like trying to fix that for them um, and then alleviate the transportation issues that are coming down from this way going up because there was really no purpose for that. Fixing the, um, the little neighborhood here in, uh, in Rogers Forge apartments um, so they can just walk across to their school. Um, and then also we had some <coughs> guiding questions that we were also just kind of wondering about. Um, for example, like who, we wanted to know who is fighting for, for Cromwell to, to remain a magnet. Is that something that's like happening? Like the majority of people want that to happen because we were also, someone brought up the fact that if Cromwell wasn't a magnet, um, that would alleviate a lot of things without having to change other things. Um, and then also like <coughs> pre-K, universal pre-K is about to happen. So because universal pre-K is gonna happen, that's gonna change the schools again, so is that something that's being considered? Um, and then also we were wondering why, what was the school over here? There was a school that isn't included, I think it's Harford Hill. Um, why isn't Harford Hill being used to alleviate Pine Grove because it's right next to it? Like, I guess, how did the line, like how did some of these schools right here get eliminated from the conversation when they're so close to each other. Um, so we put a couple of questions on here that we were just, I'm hoping that I got everything else. Um, oh, and then also, oh, yeah. can planning blocks be redrawn? That was the other question that some people had. Absolutely cut planning blocks. Uh, <laughs> And if you have any suggested planning block cuts where you think it would be better how to cut it or consolidate, you can mark that on the map and we can, we can uh, uh, incorporate those for better flexibility. Do you have a, an area that you were suggesting to cut? Well, or? I think if we knew that was possible, we may have changed the okay. options. Well, and we're just kind of wondering, like there's a few that just don't make sense. Like this across from, like why aren't these two together? Like that makes no sense. And then I also looking at the neighborhood exits because I know some exits, they only exit to a main road. So then they have to travel all the way around and it makes the bus ride like extra long for some of the communities. Um, so the transportation basically needs to be looked at. And then one more thing. Just really quick on the Timonium piece. Um, as it stands, the numbers have us like way over capacity. And as it stands right now, you know, the parents we spoke to and the administrators do not feel that impact, which, which is kind of why, you know, we're one of the schools that are trying to be relieved. If we don't need to be relieved, that should help the overall study. But the future data has us like wildly over capacity, like 130 plus percent. Um, if that's real, then that's a real problem, but we kind of want to get an idea as to where that data is coming from because that is a significant difference and we don't really have any guidance as to where that's uh, coming from. Just wanted to give you a little reason as to why we want to, why the Timonium Group wants to keep it where it is, even though we're at 116 percent on the paper. Okay. Um, I also have one other uh, question, and that's uh, we're talking about uh, reducing splits, and I um, represent Pine Grove, and I'm currently not split because of the middle school, you know, scenario that we just went through, and now I'm going to be split again. So it'd be good to know who was consolidated with the middle school effort 
and is now split because that seems like we're going backwards. Can you repeat that one more time? Your so there was a boundary study for middle school that I think we're all familiar with that yes. finished up a couple months ago, last year. Yeah. Right. And uh, the effort behind that, I think, was mainly to reduce splits. I'm not sure if it was over capacity. Okay. Okay. New, new middle school being added. And um, so there were families that were currently split, like uh, my family is one of them, and we're perfectly happy with now being consolidated. So we're all going to the same elementary, middle school, high school together where we were split before. And now this is resplitting us a year later. Uh, so I think that should be considered since it's, it's just an extra burden on people going through it twice. So uh, just from my notes, um, the, com the map six that you were talking about, with the, starting with planning blocks 19, 12, 13, that was, that was the beginning of map six. Is that correct? The and beginning edits? 901 to 905. Okay. What was that one again? One more time? It's all noted. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And then that was a build off of the current map. Yeah. Okay, great. Got it, got it. Okay, thank you so much. That's really good, good, good feedback we're getting from all groups tonight. Thank you so much. Um, okay, the light. Yep, there you go. Light pink. Here you go. All right, uh, where's the camera? Where should I be looking? This one over here? All right. Um, generally, or just our general comment was that we spent a lot of time looking at maps and moving neighborhoods around and trying to get the numbers balanced, but we found it really, really difficult to incorporate the diversity numbers into that. And so when we're moving a block around, we don't know if we're moving, if we're making the diversity better or we're making it worse. And so our suggestions, take them under advisement because of that. Um, generally speaking, uh, what Map 5 does with Pedonia, Pedonia is one of the schools we're supposed to be alleviating the overcrowding for, and Maps 3 and 4 leave it alone, but Map 5 does things about it, and generally speaking, we thought what was there made sense with the evidence available. We did suggest um, 905 sort of bumps up out of Pedonia and is surrounded by Mays Chapel and Map 5, and maybe that should go over. That should go to Mays Chapel as well. And to compensate for that, we take 915 in the south of Pedonia and bring it back into Pedonia so those kids don't have to move. So to Mays Chapel, but bring 915 back. That was the suggestion, yeah. Okay. Um, modulo, we don't know what that's doing to the diversity. Um, otherwise, Jason, you were saying map five in general makes the schools... Just a wide uh, disparity in swings on the oh, racial... Sorry. sorry. There were some wide swings on the racial uh, makeup and diversity issues in farms, like both socioeconomic and racial. There were some pretty wide swings that seemed to make some schools have more, like substantially more, and some may have substantially less diversity. Um, much more of a delta uh, on, map, on map five relative to others. That's what it looked like, but uh, I know Fergal's not done. Yeah, I, got more to <laughs> I just want to make sure Jason got his, his point in on that one. Um, for Cromwell, Cromwell expands quite a lot in a lot of the maps. Um, PB428 apparently is the, is the uh, the whipping boy of these processes, and it seems to get moved in every single uh, redistricting. And the suggestion was made within a group that it's moves because there's a lot of apartments there, not a lot of homeowners, and so these are the, these are the people without a lot of voice. Um, there was also a concern that there's a number of unapproved but planned apartment blocks in that region. And if those do get approved and those come in before the next five years, that's going to make a, a big impact and it's going to send the numbers around. And if you end up overcrowding Cromwell, Cromwell is a difficult school to expand just because of the, the terrain there. And Jason can tell you about it. He goes to that school. I don't, I don't know the physicality of it. You said 428 was the one that you mentioned that gets moved. That's, that's the whipping board, yeah. Um, the other one is PB414, which is, has got one student and it was going to get moved into Cromwell, and the concern was that that means a bus for one student, and 
given all the problems we're having with buses, that seems somewhat inefficient. Um, you've talked about Rogers Forge. I just want to say for the record for everyone here, because everyone's been saying it, we have a member of the Rogers Forge community in this group, and the member of the Rogers Forge community was adamant that PB915 belongs in Rogers Forge, right? So <laughs> we're all, I think we're all in agreement on that one. Uh, the last point I have is about my own school, Stonely. So there's two options for Stonely. Stonely gets to stay as it is, or it loses a couple of neighborhoods to West House and it gains a couple of neighborhoods on the east. Obviously, we like our community. We don't want to move people out of it unnecessarily. Our principal tells me that the numbers that we have for the capacity are overstating our enrollment at the moment. It says it's 667 or something, and we're closer to 642. So we would like to keep our neighborhoods, but we do have room to grow if that gives people the flexibility to solve the problems elsewhere. So I know it's, it, we, we, we offered this up in the last session, and it wasn't taken on board in any of the maps, and so we're offering it up a second time. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, re I'm representing the Kelly Green, Kelly Green Group. Um, I really have one point to make, and I'll, I'll try to stay on that one point. Um, I'm representing the Pedonia International families um, and a room of um, pr primarily Caucasian folks. I, it needs to be said that these maps are not only um, disappointing, these options, um, it's borderline um, disgusting. Um, the fact that Pedonia has 80% living in poverty, yet 60% of the options leave them overcrowded needs to be adjusted. So these are unacceptable. I'm Michelle Rowland. I'm the principal of Rogers Forge. And I uh, thank all of you for reiterating just uh, what I had shared at the last meeting where the Rogers Forge apartments are across the street from Rogers Forge, yet they are bused to West Towson. Uh, in any of these um, options, they were not added. Actually, what was added in one was nine houses that are million dollar townhouses that would actually have to cut through the Rogers Forge apartments to get to Rogers Forge. Um, the other piece I know that Ms. Barron had brought up about, you know, we have one bus right now that has three children on it, um, and that's because there isn't a crossing guard. Two of the options here added a neighborhood with two more kids that would require busing to Rogers Forge. That's five children on one bus. And we've got 35 children across the street who could walk to Rogers Forge. So um, in looking, I, I, I don't want to own all of this because <laughs> my passion for Rogers Forge, I could talk all night. But I also, in looking at our group, we did look at each um, map. And the, our representative from Carroll Manor seemed to think that option five was the more um, the better option, and she was really uh, speaking to looking at the um, the middle school, uh, you know, zoning that just occurred, and um, you know where those students are going to go for middle school, um, and looking at Pine Grove, um, all three options are the same, but you, we, sh yeah, she seemed to think that they were okay in looking at the schools that are involved, but there was a question as to why Harford Hills, which would be closer because basically you're taking a group of students from Pine Grove and sending them further north to Carroll Manor where you have Harford Hills, you know, in a, a closer geographic area and Harford Hills isn't a part of this conversation. Um, the thing we also talked about was just the inaccuracy of the numbers, um, significant inaccuracies, you know, in terms of, and I know if you want to look at September 30th numbers now, but when we're looking at capacity and under capacity, and I, and I don't want to be subjective in thinking what feels like it's crowded and what doesn't, but when you're looking at hard numbers, I mean, we've got, you know, they're off by 50, they're off by 30, you know, there's just a lot, and I'm hearing that from Carol Manor too, so I just, um, you know, I, I do feel like we need to update and, and make the, 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 the true numbers more accurate. One more thing, and that is, um, you know, the other piece is that there are uh, special ed programs at Pedonia where, um, you know, if, with Pedonia being so overcrowded, how many classes are? He has six classes that are special ed programs, which, you know, aren't necessarily geographically tied to Pedonia. So that's another, you know, thinking outside of the box of what we could do to alleviate some of their crowding. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we have the red group in the back.
is it okay if I go over here? <laughs> okay. Um, so we're the red group. Um, kind of what we talked about, I guess, you know, I think we're really disappointed about hearing that basically nothing is going to be done about Cromwell. There's only 130 kids zoned for Cromwell currently, and they have room for 430, and it's surrounded by schools that are kind of drowning. Um, so kind of hoarding these seats for a magnet program, like maybe it could be reevaluated because, um, you know, having the hope of another school in maybe five years and then the construction, I feel like a lot of these are Band-Aids, but maybe they're, the Band-Aids are a little too small. And I, we really wish that Cromwell was more part of the conversation. Um, being a Hampton parent, uh, I find it kind of hard to see that like not a ton of people are going to Cromwell or to Stonely. And then this is something that was said years in the last um, boundary study with Ham Pleasant Plains and Hampton. We wanted other schools to be part of the solution and not just Hampton providing the solution. And to see that maps three and four, um, you know, again, Stonely is left completely out of the conversation is just not acceptable. Um, and then on top of that, you, when you consider diversity and the lack thereof, it just is kind of further insulting. Um, and then also transportation. We have a lot of kids that are coming to Hampton that were previously from Pleasant Plains, and there would, they would be a lot um, closer to Stonely, um, even if that means potentially moving a, some Stonely parent, families to West Towson. I mean, it would be a short bus ride as well, but I know that there has to be kind of a give and take from all the communities and I think that every school should kind of see what they can bring to the table and everybody needs to be part of the solution and find a solution that they can live with. But having committee members maybe saying that they can't be part of the solution just doesn't sit well with me if they want to stay the way they are when they could be part of the solution. Um, some specific things that we talked about was the Planning block 1715 with 69 students currently zoned for Timonium. That we, we went off of map five. It, we found it to be easier to tweak to kind of get to where we wanted to get to. Um, so planning block 1715 has 69 students. It's a really big planning block. And it would be moved to Timonium, or moved to Lutherville Lab from Timonium. Um, I think that, in, it could be moved to ham half, the southern half of that planning block across Margate, which is a road with a double yellow line. It's, you know, it's the same size road as Charmouth, which is a division line for planning blocks. It's a similar, you know, dividing line. We were talking about the southern part of that planning block maybe going to Hampton, and then the northern part of that planning block staying at Timonium, and then kind of not crossing that York Road boundary and leaving that intact. Um, and we agreed with moving 1915 to Rogers Forge. And also, if Hampton potentially kind of keep, holds on to maybe some of the Timonium students in 1715 to leave 609 and 610 at Lutherville Lab on the west side of York Road. Um, and Stay at Lutherville? Is that what you yes. said? Yes. 609, 610, staying at Lutherville, and then 1715, possibly dividing that into two planning blocks with the Got southern it. portion going to Hampton and the northern portion, like north of Margate, staying at Timonium, with neither of them going to Lutherville Lab. Um, and just, yeah. But overall, I think we really liked map five with like small tweaks. And I think it, I think, um, it would be the easiest map for m the majority of the communities to kind of get behind for us. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is, did we get all the groups? Did we circle around? I think so. Um, so this has been amazing. Uh, you know, we really appreciate the input, and um, we will. We are going to take all this in and look at bringing back some.
fresh maps, some modified maps with you based off of your input. Um, do, does anybody else in the, on the committee have anything to say? I know that there's a lot of groups talking, a lot of similar comments, but I want to give people the opportunity to uh, share any thoughts now that they've heard comments from the whole group. We've got one here and one here. I did want to just mention, I mean, I think it's interesting the comment about Hampton and we have obviously representatives from here, but I also don't know enough about the school board process to say that we could just throw Hampton into the mix and not make it a magnet school, right? So if, if that's a solution and we're saying it would just be a zone neighborhood school, the school board would presumably have to, I mean, sorry, Cromwell Valley, yes, that. Would, like the school board would have to vote to change its magnet status or to do something with its magnet status in order for this to even be considered. So maybe that's possible, but we would have to know that because presumably this is going to the school board in March and if that's now gonna actually be something, like, I just don't even know if that's in the realm of possibility. So I do wanna be a little careful knowing that we have colleagues and neighbors from there. That's not that they're not willing to do whatever and be part of this process, but if it's actually a school board thing that has to happen, then that may not be a viable consideration. And I'd love to know the answer. I don't actually know. I just can imagine having worked in federal education, like you can't just snap your fingers and say like, oh, that's not a magnet school anymore, so. Um. Uh, it's something that we're hearing a lot from a lot of committee members and the people in the community. So it is something that's being recorded and that will be yeah, shared to be the other. to understand the process. Yes. Like, is that something that could be done that the school board would consider? How long would it take? Is it an option? Like, I would just be curious. And then I think the other thing was, I would love to know from the person, it's really cool that somebody made the map for five, so thanks to whoever did that, because you have a set of skills that I certainly don't have, and I think many of us don't have. I wonder, though, if there was such a focus on keeping the numbers under 100% that some of the other data that we were told to look at like demographics, community lines, like if I were to have looked at all of this, and I really didn't, so I swear, but like if you just focus on the math, you are missing some of the community lines and some of the demographics, and I think that came out from some of the comments that were made, but I just wanted to highlight that just focusing on that 100% number and then sort of without the neighborhood commentary from the committee members or the demographic commentary, I just, that's an interesting dynamic that gets into map five. So, but thanks, whoever did that, that was very cool that you did that, so thank you. I wanted to respond to the comments about Cromwell Valley and a magnet. The bottom line is the magnet program and the way that is managed and changed and established is not the purview of this committee. It's a totally different process. You know, we, we, is, you wanna talk about it, that's fine. When I suggest it, that's fine. But we can't make a change to the magnet program as part of this process. You can, you can propose, you can write letters, you can write emails to the superintendent. You can communicate what your desires are on any, on any issue. I'm not saying you can't, you can. I'm just saying that that's not something that we're able to bring into this process and make it a factor in determining what the boundaries are. If we can't factor in um, the magnet school, why are they included in this process and we're all talking about the PV blocks for that school? I, we should eliminate it. I don't know. There, there are seats available at Cromwell Valley. All right, there are some seats available. That's what Dr. Elmendorf mentioned earlier. He's the executive director in charge of those programs. 
So again, one thing we try not to do is predetermine, prejudge, predecide. It's up to the committee to decide if you want to touch a school or not touch a school or move a boundary or not move a boundary. That's for the committee. We don't say, oh, listen, they're not going to touch that because nobody's going to want to do that. That's not for us. That's for you, the committee, to decide. You can recommend, there are 19 schools, I think we said this at the first meeting, there's no requirement to change the boundaries of every school. You decide which boundaries should change and which ones don't. Some schools may not have any changes to their boundaries. That's something that you all can decide. The magnet is a program and that's a totally different activity, totally different realm that is not the purview of this this, or this group. Hi, everybody. My name is Manny. I'm uh, the um, co-chair of the Central Area Advisory Council, and I appreciate this. I apologize for being a little bit late or earlier. It's a kind of misunderstanding. Um, I think that one of the things we all teach our students and our kids is like we want to leave the place better than we left, and I think every council since I've been here has been really short-sighted. Uh, I don't think we've been looking at the macro level issues, you know, going into after the 2009 crash. Um, there was a huge push for multifamily home development all across the country. And you've reached a kind of a plateau uh, in the last couple of months and you're seeing rents go across the country plummet. Um, some of the some country, um, some states are actually looking at putting reduce uh, redu reduction on um, short-term rentals and a number of addition additional issues. And what I don't hear any besides one person who mentioned it, uh, any kind of structural change in the the process of estimation. I, I don't think we're going to get far from this issue if we don't look at the five pro approved rentals. Uh, developments that are being made in, in, in Towson without having some kind of capital funding kind of approach change. Because I think that's where the issue is. Everyone wants to have a good quality education for all their kids, but we're, we're just, whatever that process is, I don't know what it is, um, it's gotta change, it's gotta change now. I mean, if, you, if you're a family of three trying to afford buying a house, moving out to some of the areas where there's less densely pop population, it's gonna be really hard doing it at 7%. I mean, so I've obviously, I think we need to stop looking at things in a vacuum and look longer term. And um, the other part of this, I think, is a learning issue. You know, what's the difference between a, a three bedroom, a three house, three room, a three bedroom house in West Towson versus three bedroom house in East Towson, right? So this is 100 years of, of just progress of trying to change things. It's gonna be messy. I think we need to uh, be more um, aware of you know where where legacy of certain issues have happened, um, and um, I think there's something else I wanted to say <laughs> on top of that, but no, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Uh, any any other comments or uh, questions from the committee? Yes, sir. Regarding the magnet program, uh, to the extent that a change could be made. And I am not commenting on whether a change should be or could be. I don't know anything about the magnet program. I'm just wondering if a change could be made, what is the timeline? Is that something that could be done next year? Is that a five year? Is that a 10 year? Because if it's like next year that it's possible, then we shouldn't be redistricting 9,900 kids. There's been, been a lot of questions about the magnet tonight. And I do have a note, um, my, the note that I have, thing I have noted is what is the process for changing or relocating a magnet program. And I'll include the timeline. So we will follow up with a little more detail on how the magnet process works. And like Mr. Taylor said, it's not something that this committee can, uh, has the ability to recommend a change to, because they have their own processes, but it's something that we will give you more clarity and guidance on how that process works, so that you're informed and can participate in that process as well. I'm about to become the most unpopular person in this room. Yes, I'm a Cromwell Valley parent, very proud one. Um, what everyone here is talking about is get rid of the magnet as if that is the solution to all problems in this room. It is not. 
there are 130 district students to the school. The school has about 400 students total. So doing that math, that's about 270 students that attend via the magnet program. Many, if not most, of those come from the central area. So when we're talking about overcrowding in various parts of the central area, all 19 schools, I believe it is, right, 19? All 19 schools, you're looking at a handful of seats that at best could provide any relief. It'd be the equivalent of me, as I like to point out, taking a bottle of water, this is your volume, put your finger in the bottle of water and flick it off, and that's it. that volume is still there. Like, it's not going to change much by doing anything with it. Um, there are other solutions. And yes, really what it comes down to is there needs to be a new school somewhere. That's what needs to happen in the end. But it is not going to solve all problems. We are focusing on the wrong thing in my estimation, and I realize I am biased for sure. So I would just ask people to stop focusing on that as the sole solution and let's look at how we're going to solve this problem moving forward as Cromwell Valley already helps resolve some of the overcrowding in some of the central area schools as it is. Thank you. We're about 20 minutes over our time. Um, we just one more, one more comment and then we'll let you guys adjourn, okay? Hold on one second. Let's get you. If everybody's pressed about the magnet, can we also be pressed about the possibility of this happening again in five years and reconsidering affecting all the schools? I think that should be a big point that's being pressed on as well. That's all I have to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that if, there are, are there, if there are any other comments that you have or questions, please... Uh, Email us, we would, or we could talk with you. We definitely want to make sure that your voices are heard, but we also want to be mindful of your time. And uh, people have babysitters and things like that. Get home. So, um, but so a very constructive meeting tonight, guys. Thank you so much. Our next meeting will be Thursday, November second. We will be back back here to meet with you guys. So thank you again. Have a good night.